750, it looks like a 757. Do you guys know all the planes by all the equipment? When I was a kid, I used to go up to Heathrow Airport. It's about 30 minutes from where I lived and in a coach and just sit there watching planes land. I always find it uh, kind of intriguing. And you could write to the airline companies and they'd send you a postcard of their most recent piece of equipment and stuff and all kinds of details. It's kind of fun. But this is a 757, I guess. I think it is anyway. Uh, so um, domestic route, uh, three by three. So, so not a wide body jet, but it's a, a what they, what's the opposite of a wide body jet? A thin body? Uh, or a regular jet. And actually, uh, the engines are quite big for it. Uh, not as big as in the 777, 777. Uh, but I think it has a lot of wing area for some reason. But anyway, there was a f relatively famous example of uh, an executive jet coming in behind one of these things. And you see the, the vortices uh, rolling off the, the wings. And it, it does have a lot of lift, I think, from the wings. And this jet was coming in at whatever was the uh, required separation in those days. And it got slammed into the ground at... Uh, or not LAX, I think it was Orange County, John Wayne Airport, just uh, in the LA region. And so they ultimately changed the, the rules to give a longer separation for air traffic control to schedule people to come in behind these things. So, so we will talk about lift today and uh, planes. Uh, let's look at a bit of time left. Uh, what else? We'll look at these. Yeah, uh, this is always an interesting thing. You know, you must have seen this in Physics classes in high school, I would guess. I'm not sure. The old galloping Gertie, as it's called, the Tacoma was was named for this. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, mid '50s, I think. Uh, still black and white. Uh, I guess they had uh, color film photography during the Second World War, so '45. Uh, but but maybe TV at this time was certainly black and white until the early. 70s brats for color TVs. And so this is just a, a bridge designed to spec, but without realizing that uh, one of the things that could happen to a bridge was that um, winds blowing over it, not hurricane force winds, uh, not particularly fast winds, but just constant winds blowing at some particular speed. And actually what happens is we'll talk about, I don't think we'll do it today, but maybe uh, on uh, Friday, is if you look at the, the deck as being this rectangular section, uh, it, uh, you can also look at a, a sphere and you get uh, what's called a von Karman vortex uh, street. And what it is, is it, it ejects a vortex at the top hand, top part of the deck, and then a bit later it ejects uh, one from the bottom, and then it repeats. So if you look down, you have these individual vortices being carried away from the deck. And you have right below it the same, but they're offset by half each of the lower vortex, vortices is in the middle. And so every time a vortex is shed, it gives a little bump to the, to the bridge. And so it's not, like, uh, not unlike a guitar string. If you pluck it at the right uh, uh, resonant uh, frequency, it builds on itself. And that's exactly what it does here. I guess uh, someone abandoned their car. Apparently, there was a dog left in the car. <laughs> because that's not really very funny, but <laughs> and uh, well, the car went the car went down, of course, and uh, with the bridge. So yeah, so resonance, uh, so aer aeroelasticity, I guess they'd call that, the same as the mechanics of uh, flight structures. So that was just to fill some time while the rest of you got here. So um, uh, we well, we're a minute before. So the, uh, the other image I'll show is this. Well, it's kind of fun. So we'll talk about uh, drag and lift today. Uh, we didn't talk about it last time. We didn't talk about these little equations at the top of our sheet. Uh, and this is a trip, I think, uh, April 19, 2015, as I recall. Don't often get to travel business class, but sometimes if you can upgrade or spend some miles and some money, then you can do it. So this is sitting in the little cupola on the top of a 747, naturally looking backwards at the wings, uh, taken off from O'Hare, uh, going to Beijing, as it turned out. 
and just for a change. Um, and you see the wings, I used to always say, to our, did they bigger the wings yet? Uh, they put these uh, leading uh, edge flaps down on the front, which I guess right here, right, to, to essentially make the, the wing larger. And you can't see it here, but the, uh, the back of the wing comes out on lots of little louvers, so the wing is much wider than it is when it's in uh, cruising flight. And the idea is that at low speeds, you like to get a lot of lift. Uh, and so you can engineer the wing to be a high lift wing for when you take off. Uh, but then when you're airborne and you don't uh, need so much lift because uh, uh, you're traveling much faster and lift, you might imagine, because of Euler number, is proportional to V squared. Um, so uh, lift is uh, available to you very readily because you're traveling at high speed. Take off at 100 miles an hour, I'd guess. Uh, you cruise at 500 miles an hour. And then uh, ultimately these uh, leading edges will retract, as I guess we'll see in a sec. Uh, and then you go on your merry way. You climb up and you do your thing. So, so anyway, going to happen sometime, I guess. Oh, not that soon. That's the way to do it. That's the way to look at these videos. 5 speed, 10 speed, 30 speed, there you go, done. So, and then go on your merry way. And of course, traveling to uh, China is a bear now because you can't overfly Russia in an American airline. Uh, because the, as you know, the shortest place way between two points on a sphere is the Great Circle. Great Circle between Chicago and Beijing is across the pole. And then down over Siberia. And so that's off limits to American and European airlines, not off limits to Chinese airlines, as it turns out. So anyway, so that's that. Um, so, okay. Oh, bad turn out again. Assuaging my ego by turning up for, for this. Uh, we didn't get so far last time. We had a little uh, tour, I guess, didn't we? So it was kind of fun uh, with some relevance to, um, to fluid mechanics. So um, what I'd like to do today is we, we kind of did a summary of where we are uh, to look at um, what we've, you've been looking at over the last few weeks, week 9, 10, and 11. Uh, now we're in week 12, so we kind of summarized that. Um, what we'll talk about today is first these uh, equations, which we didn't talk about last time, these equations here. Uh, for drag and lift, to be able to define exactly what those are. Spend a little bit of time over it. Uh, and then we'll come back to defining these coefficients of drag and lift. And, you know, to, I'm not giving the, the game away by rewriting these as, well, I can do it quite here. A lift force divided by an area is actually a pressure. And so you can think of these as Euler numbers. arbitrary half in there because it comes with half g squared. v squared over 2g is where that comes from. And so these are kind of Euler numbers. And in the same way that we talked last time that in dimensional analysis, if you do an experiment on a plane which is shrunk down in a, a wind tunnel, then if you do the experiment at the right Reynolds number, you have the correct flow regime uh, in terms of the vortices or no vortices around the wings. And therefore, if you measure the forces on that wing or the plane, you can translate that somehow into the forces on, from the model into the, the prototype. So that's what we will do today. And so we'll talk about uh, drag, and we'll talk about uh, lift. And I won't go back through the, to recap the stuff we talked about last time, uh, but only to, to mention that uh, you probably understand exactly what drag and lift are. I mean, the, the definition of it is that drag is the force that's applied in the direction of the airflow, as you might imagine. It's, and lift is the force that's applied perpendicular to that airflow, uh, as you could well imagine without me telling you that. And you'd be interested in those things for cars to reduce drag so you get better efficiency. You'd like to reduce lift, perhaps, so you don't uh, fly off the uh, road. If you have negative lift, I guess you're plastered to the road and your tires would work better for traction and for steering. Uh, we looked at some examples with telltales on a wings, and you could do that on a bus as well. 
Uh, we'll look at airfoils a bit later. And this is basically uh, these two expressions that we looked at before. So the idea is drag and lift. Uh, the best example maybe is to look at an airfoil because it's obviously something that we can all relate to. And there, as we alluded to last time, there are kind of, since there are two, um, it's kind of related to this, since there are two regimes, laminar and turbulent regimes, we know that in the laminar regime, the main property that controls the motion of fluid, resists the motion of fluid, is the viscosity acts against it. And viscosity is important in this regime. In fact, we know that if you look at pipe flow, laminar flow, the friction coefficient is a function of 96 over Reynolds number. So it's inversely proportional to Reynolds number. And so it's, it's controlled by the viscosity. If you look at turbulent flow, it's the opposite. Uh, it's not a function of Reynolds number. The fact that these curves are dead flat means they don't change as a function of Reynolds number. And the only parameter controlling this out of the fluid properties is the density. And so uh, we can think about those characteristics if we look at uh, lift. And there's, not surprisingly, there are two components that we can look at in lift and drag. And they're epitomized by this uh, diagram here. This is the surface of the airfoil. We know that pressures are always applied normal to the surface. Uh, and we know that fluid flowing past it flows parallel to the surface. And you can imagine that the, the drag of the molasses against the surface is in the direction of which it flows, which has to be parallel to the, the, the surface. And so what we'd like to do is we can look at the force that's applied by the pressure. And that would be the pressure multiplied by the length over which it's applied. That gives us the force that's normal to that boundary. But we'd like to be able to reconcile it to some other direction. And the direction we'd like to reconcile it to would be the vertical if we're looking at, for instance, the effect of lift on an airfoil. So these individual arrows represent the pressure applied on the surface. This is the top surface of the airfoil. So the red region here is negative pressure below atmospheric pressure. Uh, and so if the pressure is lower, don't know what that is, don't want it. So if the background pressure is below atmospheric, it's sucking it up. And the increase in pressure below is pushing it up. So these are additive to each other. And so we'd like to know exactly what these magnitudes are in some direction. I don't know why I did that. And the direction we might be interested in for lift would be in this direction. And for drag, perhaps right in here, drag would be in this direction. So the drag, I suppose, would be going f towards the right. The fluid is going past and is dragging the wing to the right. If you want to resist it, the reaction is pushing to the left. Uh, so we need to get our signs right. But if we know what the pressure is that's acting perpendicular to this, then we can get the, bless you, the component which is uh, in the vertical direction. And we can get the, ver the component of drag. So this would be the lift. This would be the component of drag, which is going to be the force applied on that structure multiplied by cosine of alpha, which is just the component which is in the x direction here. Likewise, is a, a force applied by the shear. Shear stress multiplied by an area. The area is the length of this uh, segment here, but it's also the area into the plane of the paper as well, or the board. And this is the area. And of course, the component that's horizontal would be uh, sine theta, t, tau w dA sine theta. And so those are exactly the components that come to play in these expressions. If you like, we can decompose the two effects into the effect of pressure, which is given by these uh, arrows. You notice they're always perpendicular to the boundary, because that's how pressure acts. And the shear stresses, which are always parallel to the contour of the boundary that's acting. And so that's merely taking these two components. This is for drag. This is area times pressure, which is a force, corrected for the direction in which it's applied. Shear stress times area, which is a force, multiplied, corrected by the direction in which it's applied. So nothing more than that. 
And so we can reconcile those in terms of uh, directions. And we might also imagine that the magnitudes of these pressures and shear forces change depending on our Reynolds number because the flow regime will change. And so you can imagine that uh, in this, if you take a plate and you have that plate acting horizontally, then certainly there would be a, for a pressure that would build up at the tip of this, just like the uh, you know, San Francisco International truck being blown off the runway. You kill momentum and then you build up a pressure uh, where you kill momentum. But the larger part of the drag on this particular case would be the shear force, which is a function of the viscosity. If you cant the plate over so it's facing the flow, then there's a big pressure drag here. There might be a little bit of uh, shear drag at the top and bottom, which you could also accommodate. But by far, the, the biggest forces are going to be the ones caused by the impinging jet on the thing. We have to do the experiments at the right flow regime, and that's what we should have got to last time. I'm going to come back to this uh, a bit later. I pulled that from notes. And so there are a couple of examples in here. Perhaps uh, there is no test example on that, those two equations, so you know that. You heard that here. Um, well, I guess I haven't written the test yet, so I don't know that. I shouldn't say that. There's unlikely to be a test on what we'll talk about now, but it's important to see what, how you do this. It's a bit contrived. And so if you wanted to, uh, to work out what the forces, the drag forces are on a plate, if you have it horizontally or if you have it vertically, then it's a bit contrived because you need to know exactly what the expression is that gives you the magnitudes of the pressures on that plate and the shear stresses on that plate. So these are just, you could get it by doing something in a, uh, a wind tunnel and measure the pressures and you could, I guess you'd measure the shear forces only by being able to calculate the force that you'd have to apply to hold this plate in, in place. And so you'd have an average shear force that's applied to the whole plate rather than a distribution. But if you had a solution by solving Navier-Stokes equations, you could perhaps define it. And so it happens that the solutions for this are that the shear stress that's applied on the plate is given by this, some constant, which is given by some constant divided by square root x. And so x is in the left to right direction. x equals 0 is here. And so all that's being drawn here when x is 0, it's equal to the shear stress on the bottom is equal to 0. And so this ordinate here is the magnitude. I guess these are the values of the shear stress on the top and bottom parts of the plate, if you think about what they are. And as, you, as x gets progressively larger, it's this square root of uh, x magnitude. Um, and uh, so the magnitude of this shear stress is this. I guess you could imagine that um, an incremental length along this plate is this, which we call d sub a, or not d sub a, d a before. And so if we want to apply those expressions that we had before, these would be the magnitudes of the lift and drag expressions. The, uh, the flow against here would stagnate here, so there would be a pressure at this point here, but let's ignore that. The pressure acting on the so top is there's no change from atmospheric. Atmospheric or gauge pressure is zero in this particular case. And so we can use that expression to try and figure out what the, the lift on this structure would be by looking at the expressions that define that behavior. And so if you look at the uh, pressure applied on the top, you multiply the pressure by the area. The pressure is zero everywhere. You look at the pressure on the bottom. Uh, the pressure on the bottom is zero everywhere, and therefore not surprising, um, the lift is equal to zero. You could also imagine that if there is some small effect that the pressure changes by some amount on here, then it may well be that the pressure acting downwards, you'd imagine it would be exactly symmetric. If for some reason there's a distribution of pressure on the plate that looked like this, you'd imagine that on the other side it would look like this as well. And so the magnitudes pushing up and pushing down would exactly cancel. So 
In this case, it cancels because the pressures are equal to zero, but you could imagine if it was non-zero that you could rationalize that they would be equal to zero. If you look at the, the, um, the drag, so the drag would be acting in this direction. This is our squirrely D value. And it's going to be due to the shear stress. And so the expression for that would be the magnitude of the shear stress times the area. Uh, we've got rid of the cosines and sines because they're directly aligned in the direction of flow, just as a conceptual line, much easier to do it this way. We know that the shear distribution on the top is if, you know, so the shear, the total shear force is actually the area under this curve, right? That's the definition of what a, an integral is. So the area under this curve multiplied by the, the width of this curve. If, oh, I'm such an artiste. So this would be W. And I think <coughs> W is 10 feet in this particular case. And so in other words, this integral and this integral are the same. So if you look at these two integrals, it just becomes double the magnitude on the top. And so if you are able to take this value as being equal to a constant over, actually it's easier to write to this, as x to the minus half, square root, right? This term here. And then if you put that in this expression here, this is the constant, this is the width of the plane, uh, of the plate, this is uh, x to the minus half, and this is integrated with respect to the x direction. And if you do that integration, the limits are the tip of the plate. The plate is four feet deep. So this length, this is four feet, this is zero feet. And from that, you can just get the magnitude of the drag force which is applied, which is a numerical new value, which is 0 0.0992 pounds, apparently. OK? Pretty straightforward. If you do the same, if you pull the plate over, then you can do exactly the same again. Now you'd imagine that the flow would look like this. It would stagnate here. And the flow stagnating is the reason that you have this pressure distribution pushing the plate downstream. The flow, so these arrows are pressures, but you could imagine that the streamlines would look like this. and look like this. And depending on the flow regime, you, can, you might imagine that there's separation on it, and there's these vortices that are shed, and it's all messed up in this region here, lots of turbulence. Doesn't have to be that, but you could imagine that. And so we have an expression that defines the pressure as a function of the location on this plane. It, uh, this is y equals 0, and so as you go up, it's y squared. So it would be this distribution. As you go down, the pressure is the exact mirror of that. This is minus y as you go down. Minus y squared is a positive number. And on the back side, it's a, just a uniform pressure from the distribution. And so you could surmise from this, uh, again, we're looking at drag. So the drag force is going to be the sum of those magnitudes. So the pressure distribution is going to give a, an amount. Of course, there is also a component. If you drew this plate, there's going to be a magnitude of a shear stress acting upwards here and acting downwards here. It's going to be, you'd imagine it would be symmetric. We don't know what it is, but from the symmetry, we'd expect that the part that's below this midpoint and the part that's above it should exactly cancel, right? So the net influence of these is that the lift is zero due to the shear force. Um, and also, and it has no component in the x direction. And so the drag component of this shear force is zero. And so the expression to give us the drag is going to be uh, these two expressions here. So the lift in this particular case, which is, I guess, the, the point I was making, shear stress is upwards. Shear stresses downwards exactly cancel each other, so the amount of net lift on that system due to this and this is zero. 
The effect of pressure is only in the x direction, so there is no component in the vertical, the y direction, and so uh, these things should directly cancel out. Uh, this, in fact, in this case, this integral here has to be zero. I guess this this overall integral has to be zero, right? Because that is the sum of these forces here, and on the back side, there might be some distribution of forces like this. You could imagine those would be exactly equal and opposite, and so this integral on the back side, unfortunately named back side, uh, are zero, and the drag is just equal to the amount on the front minus the amount on the back. The amount of them front is a positive amount due to this killing momentum. The amount on the back due to this disruption is actually uh, a reduction in pressure. This is suction, if you like, pulling it down. So these two things get added. And if you add those two together, this is the amount on the front face. This is the, the, the vacuum, if you like, partial vacuum on the back face. And it's minus that vacuum because we're resolving the forces in the correct direction. This is the width of the plate into the board. And the integration is between uh, minus 2 and plus 2 because it's a 4 feet high plate. And if you do that, apparently it works out to be this. Right? Yeah. Right here? Yeah, you do. It's tiny. And we don't have an equation for it. Yeah, it would be tiny. So it's just a matter of what the dominant effects would be. You would have some. So, and we, but we don't know that. Just like in this case, you'd also have a pressure in the upstream as well that would act on drag. And so, sorry. So that's what those uh, expressions, uh, where those expressions come from. And so now, um, so you could imagine that you could use those to figure out that. And there's a bunch of different examples here. I won't go through it. You could look at different shapes. If you knew what the pressure was at, on this, you can imagine that on this particular shape, it's kind of a more exaggerated thick plate uh, rather than our thin plate that we looked at. So here you would have an effect of pressure drag on the upstream portion. And you'd also have shear drag on the uh, top portion. So this would be controlled by viscosity, and this would be controlled by density. You're killing momentum. The, the velocity is going from some far field velocity and being set to zero where it hits the plate. It's the same thing we did for the truck in San Francisco. We can calculate what that would be, and that would give a net green force that would have to be reacted against. And if you sum up the blue forces, then there's a, a shear drag that you have to react against. And so in reality, that kind of explains why these expressions uh, that we zoomed through, from what well, we didn't mention last time, uh, these expressions have two components, one due to pressure drag and one due to shear drag. Get a bit scary because you have these expressions, uh, trigonometric expressions, but that's just to resolve so that the forces are with the flow for drag and perpendicular to the flow for lift. And so I suppose you could imagine, if you wanted, you could go to a wind tunnel um, and you could, within your airplane wing, you could have lots of little holes or pressure sensors that could measure this pressure. And so you could imagine, you could characterize what this distribution of fluid pressures would be. I'm not sure you could do it so well here. Um, you'd need to measure velocities. I guess you could do that with smoke. If you know the viscos velocity and you know the viscosity, you can change that into a, a shear force from Newton's law of viscosity. dy is in this direction. This is y. And so you could do that as well. So you could characterize exactly what these fluid pressures are. So you, we were given them in the last example, uh, and we could measure them in a wind tunnel, or we could solve an equation to do that. The other thing you could also imagine doing, I guess I'm trying to get it to, to come out of that mode, is uh, you could also do some modeling to figure out what those are. So I no longer have this... Uh, model on my computer, but I'm reminded that a decade ago, I did have this uh, COMSOL numerical model. This is from 2013, I think. Well, you might recognize this stuff. Things don't change much in a decade. 
<laughs> Except perhaps I didn't have a cold then. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. So what we could do is we, instead of doing a wind tunnel, we could do the, the, the uh, equivalent, which would be to do some modeling, which would give us those stresses that were acting on a, on a plane. And so this is exactly this done in real time. So this is the idea that you have an airfoil, not a very efficient airfoil. You notice that airfoils are thin at the back because you want to have a larger, uh, a longer pathway on the top of the airfoil than the bottom so that the velocity of the fluid speeds up. But in this case, it's slightly canted. It's not horizontal. So it would cha change the flow regime to be able to do that. And so what I'm doing is that the right one I'm running, or am I running this one? Hello. Did my voice change in 10 years? I don't think so. And so you could try doing a model that represents this. So a model is we try and solve the equations for flow, which are the Navier-Stokes equations, which we didn't spend much time doing. Uh, but they allow us to solve, remember, three equations for three velocities and one equation for continuity. Those are the Navier-Stokes equations. So at each of these nodes, in this little triangular mesh, we solve for, for actually three properties. Velocity in the x, velocity in y, and pressure at that node. There are only three equations here, two for f equals ma and one for continuity, because it's a two-dimensional problem, not a three-dimensional problem. And what we could do is we could apply a boundary condition so that there's air flowing past this stat static wing at a velocity of one meter a second at the upstream boundary, going out of the system at one meter a second downstream, and then choose parameters for the fluid that define this behavior. And then we could calculate what the pressures and shear stresses are on that wing in the model and see if we can plot those to decide exactly what this um, coefficient of drag or lift is that is defined by our system. So that's exactly what we're attempting to do. So if you saw the last little window open, it defined some parameters. Um, and those parameters you might recognize. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I could try doing it in real time, but I don't have the code, as I say. But if you look at these parameters, you might recognize some of them. Density, one kilogram per cubic meter. Actually, that's pretty close to the density of air. Viscosity, what we've called mu, 10 to the minus 4 pascal seconds, and forces that are applied on the system. So those are the fluid properties that we're defining. And what, we're, what we can then do is we can run the model. I won't bore you with the running of it. But we'd like to be able to vary the velocity of the model because that would give us some different numbers of velocity in the drag coefficient, which we haven't really talked about. So we could vary the velocity, or we could actually just keep the velocity at one meter a second and vary another parameter. So we know that in Reynolds number, Reynolds number is uh, velocity, density of the fluid, and a characteristic length. Characteristic length is probably be the length of our airfoil, which we have here. And it's divided by viscosity. And so what we could do is we could keep density constant, one kilogram a meter a second per cubic meter, the velocity constant, one meter a second in and out, and we could change the viscosity to be anything we like. And so that's exactly what uh, we will do. And if we do that, you can see uh, as we run this, uh, I think that's actually, I guess my, my fine motor skills aren't up to what they should be. I guess I could use a mouse right now. Anyway, take it on trust that we're changing the velocity, uh, viscosity. And as we change the viscosity, if I can get... So what I'm going to do is plot the velocity field. Sorry, you can see two things there. So these two realizations, you saw one earlier, I think, right? Uh, as it goes through, as I switch through these. So this is one realization of uh, the velocity with one particular viscosity. And if, I, if you run it for multiple ones, so this is just running it for a whole sequence of different viscosities, those ones there, which are different, therefore, Reynolds numbers. 
And different Reynolds numbers means that the flow regime around the, the wing will start looking different. And so the results that come out of it, you should start seeing those. So this is, you see this separation at the back. It's not nice creeping flow that creeps around the wing and then uh, connects with the, the flow from underneath the wing on the other side. And... Do this. But there, okay, that's exactly what I want to get. So, uh, so you saw two different realizations there. So this is a high Reynolds number. You see the separation at the back of the wing, so it's not the flow on the top of the airfoil isn't joining with the flow on the bottom of it. Uh, and I think there was one that was at a lower Reynolds number. No, I can't do it. Anyway, you, so then the next thing you can do is you could plot, and that's exactly what is here, from the airfoil upwards, the velocity. And so this is the distance from the surface of the airfoil up to the top of the mesh. You see that these arrows are the velocities. They're roughly uniform a long way away from the airfoil, but close to the airfoil, they change. And if you plot the velocities on this vertical axis uh, upwards from the airfoil, you see that at low Reynolds number, you get this creeping flow, um, which is a gradual change in velocity as you go up. But as you're close to a higher Reynolds number, you get a much uh, more stark change in velocity. You get a boundary layer developing, which uh, produces a different velocity profile. And that is what gives you that separation that you saw. So that's creeping flow, low velo Reynolds number. Increase the Reynolds number, and you get this separation downstream of the airfoil. And so then, in the code, the code calculates the pressure, calculates the shear stresses on the surface. You can integrate those inside the code, and then you can try plotting them. I look like I've got... Uh, been drinking too much the night before in this on, right? <laughs> but you see this. So what we're going to do is we're going to plot coefficient of drag. And coefficient of drag is really an Euler number. So if you look at the uh, terms, it's a drag force divided by an area. So that's a pressure divided by density and velocity squared. We've kept the velocity one meter a second. The area of the wing is one meter wide by one meter into the page. Um, the density is one kilogram per cubic meter. And we can calculate from the code exactly what the integrated drag force is applied on this structure. And we can also calculate Reynolds number. Reynolds number is velocity, length, density over viscosity. So velocity is one meter a second, length is one meter, and uh, density is one cubic meter one kilogram per cubic meter. The only thing that's changing is viscosity. So if viscosity is 100, then it'll change Reynolds number to be 1 over 100, which is 10 to the minus 2. And if viscosity is 10, 1, minus 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, etc. Then if I get over my uh, shakes from drinking too much the night before, and you plot the forces that come out of this, then you get a graph that looks like this. So I think that's pretty cool. And so you see something in this. So what we're doing is we're measuring in the code the drag and the pressure forces that are integrated on that wing. Uh, and they, in the creeping flow at very low Reynolds numbers, you get this linear form that goes down to here. And then at high velocity flows, you get this linear form which joins it and goes horizontal. And so these are what we've talked about before, that they should be controlled by viscosity because they're a function of Reynolds number. Uh, and depending on the shape, it's proportional to 1 over Reynolds number. And in this, they're independent of Reynolds number. And they're directly the same as in um, uh, pipe flow that we talked about last time. So that's what we've... Uh, so that was... That saves me from loading that uh, stuff on my code. And so the reason for talking about that is to now come back to this. So 
So this is what I was going to talk about on um, Monday, but didn't get to. And so to, to bring everything into the same um, focus is that the stuff that we do now in the applications for internal flows, pipe flow, external flows, which are airfoils and uh, forces on structures, and open channel flows, they actually have a commonality and they conform to the same behaviors. If we're talking about um, dimensional analysis, then we talk about geome geometric similitude. Uh, each of these we have to have kinematic similitude in terms of Reynolds number. And then we can measure the forces on a model and upscale that to real prototype by looking at the Euler numbers. And so that is manifest, if you like, in these charts that you've already seen. So when we talked about pipe flow, we used the Moody chart. We realized that the friction factor is in some way equivalent to an Euler number. There's a regime where we want to make sure that the flow regime is the same uh, in our model and our prototype. So we make sure we have kinematic similitude. And that's important because where we are on this curve matters where we are in Reynolds number. We know that in this particular zone, the friction factor is proportional to Reynolds number. This curve is 96 over RE for flow within a circular pipe. And we know that the viscosity here is what controls behavior. And we know that density here controls behavior. And Reynolds number is no longer important. We get, ex not surprisingly, we get exactly the same behavior. We've just shown it, proved it to ourselves when we look at external flows. External flows only differ perhaps um, philosophically, because for confined flows, we're interested in the force that gets applied by the pipe onto the flow in slowing it down. Here we're interested in the force that gets applied on the structure uh, by the, the flow that gets slowed down immediately around the structure, uh, but doesn't change a long way away from it. If this is an airfoil, we can look at the drag. We want to make sure we're in the right regime, so we make sure that the Reynolds number is the right number that we have. We define, uh, I guess it wants to go on the side. The Reynolds number, as you know, is equal to density, velocity, some kind of characteristic length, and uh, which we choose, and viscosity. What we did before is we set the density to one cubic kilogram per cubic meter, velocity to one meter per second, uh, length to the length of the airfoil, and we changed the viscosity, and we got a curve that exactly was like this. It broke not at 2,000, it was something else. I think it was a, a different number from that, so I don't know how the veracity of the solution exactly, but we saw exactly these two, two characteristics. And we haven't talked about it yet, but we will talk about open channel flows flowing in a ditch or a river. They're different because these flows are driven by a pressure gradient between upstream and downstream. Flows within a ditch, the pressure at the surface here is essentially the same as it is downstream, no pressure change. But what's driving flow is inclination and gravity. Higher potential upstream, lower potential downstream causes flow. Um, what we'll find also is that for all characteristic flows that we're interested in, the characteristic length that appears in the Reynolds number is so big in these open channel flows that for all intents and purposes, we're always in this turbulent regime. And so that this same graph exists, but we're always to the right-hand side of this red line. And we'll talk about what's called a Manning coefficient after Mr. Manning, I think it was Mr. Manning in those days, who developed an equation to define the flow rate in an open channel as a function of this coefficient n, or Chezy, the Chezy equation, the French equivalent of the same equation, and that defines the behavior. So that's kind of where we're going with this. So I think it's useful. Take a picture of this, uh, or go back to the movie. Go and see the movie when it's online. Uh, comes to a cinema near you, and look at that. And so that kind of codifies everything we'll talk about. I'm not sure what else we have to talk about here. What else was I going to talk about? Anything? No, that's kind of most of the things I was going to talk about. I guess I was going to come back to these uh, lift and drag coefficients. So I've made a big thing. Uh, 
of these particular relations that we talked about here, this and this. So this is merely how we get values for the drag and lift, which then go into these equations. So pretty much for your use, understanding exactly how these coefficients of drag and coefficients of lift change as a function of velocities, or Reynolds number, is really all you need from this class. We're not really going to go back to this. Maybe there's some homework assignments to do that. But really, we need to understand these lift and drag coefficients. So when you look at the coefficients that we're trying to define that describe these flows, friction factor was what defined the drag within the pipe. Coefficient of drag or coefficient of lift would be the magnitudes of this parameter, which we're interested in knowing what it is with Reynolds number. They change with Reynolds number, again, because the flow regimes around these airfoils look like either creeping flow or they look like non-creeping flow with separation. This is what we talked about about von Karman vortex streets uh, at the beginning of class, this separation at the back. So clearly, if you look at this flow here, it's not the same looking at, at this. And therefore, this is a different regime that's indexed by Reynolds number. Interestingly enough, if you look here, or if you look here, or if you look here, then this flow doesn't change too much. And so that's why this curve is kind of horizontal. And the one thing which I didn't perhaps explain in much detail, but perhaps is worthwhile drawing here, and that is that our airfoil, if we have velocities upstream that look like this, as we draw them, it would look the same downstream. But if we look at the flow velocities in the vicinity of this uh, airfoil, so this is velocity, and this is velocity, and this is, well, we call it y in the, the figures. So if we looked at the behavior for laminar flow, then the flow velocity would kind of look like this. It would asymptote to some, it wouldn't come back on itself, it would go vertically upwards. This value here would be the same as this average value here. I am drawing it the same. So that's one way that the, the flow would look. If you looked at the turbulent case, then the distribution would look slightly different. It would look much more closely to this, and then this. So you end up with this so-called uh, boundary layer. So a very thin layer, which is right next door to the wing. And the flow, it's all messed up and turbulent. But it turns out that this actual boundary layer is much more efficient than this viscous air, which eats up a lot of energy, because it's like a pack of cards sliding against each other for Newton's law of viscosity, which actually burns a lot of energy in dissipating with heat in this region. And so that's the reason why, when you look at these behaviors, uh, shown here, I guess. Yeah. So these are the behaviors for a, a bad airfoil, which is just a flat plate. With the distribution due to laminar flow, it's kind of this gradual change in velocity as you get away from the plate which goes down to the background flow rate as you get far away from it and far downstream as well. If you increase the Reynolds number, so this is 0.1, this is 10, and this is a, mi a million, yeah, so 10 to uh, 10 million. And then this has basically a very thin layer here where there's a it has to be zero at this point because it's attached to the wing, and it has to go from zero very rapidly to the background number, and so it looks uniform. And so that's the reason why you end up with this curve, which even though it's counterintuitive, if you think about the drag coefficient, coefficient of drag versus Reynolds number, it looks exactly like what we plotted. So this would be 10 to the 7. This would be 0 0.1. This would be 10. 
and this may well be 2,000-ish, like it was in pipe flow. I think it is also. You know, it's the order of 1,000 for these external flows as well. And so that's the reason why that is the case. And so, and so uh, let's do, yeah, perhaps this is even a better figure. So this isn't an airfoil, but it shows that at very low Reynolds numbers, a tenth, 50, and 100,000, that you go from a creeping regime where the flow creeps around here. You'd expect the big effect of drag to be the viscous effects that are all around here, which you can um, rotate so they're in the x direction. You can calculate their components. As you increase this velocity, just like in our aerofoil, you get this separation at the back, uh, which is kind of gradual. And as you increase the velocity even more, you get this very turbulent wake, uh, which ends up being actually more effective in terms of reducing drag. And so you could calculate what the drag is in each of these cases just by using this equation that the coefficient of drag is equal to drag divided by a half density velocity squared times some area. We already said that this force of drag divided by area is the same as a pressure divided by a half rho v squared. v squared, of course, is the far field velocity. Uh, the, the velocity close to the wing is all messed up. It's zero at the wing, and it goes back to the far field velocity as you go away from it. So it's indeterminate as to what you should choose. So this is always the far field velocity that you're interested in, that you use here. And so you can rearrange that into a drag force, which is equal to a coefficient of drag that's multiplied by a half rho v squared times a. And so all you have to do is know what the drag coefficient is. So if you know what the Reynolds number is, then you know what that drag coefficient is by doing that. You know what the density of your fluid is. It's a, cubic, a, a kilogram per cubic meter if it's air. It would be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter if it's water. You know, need to know what the far field velocity is. If it's a plane, it's the velocity it's flying at. The, flo the, the, the air flow is zero if it's stagnant in the air and the plane's plowing through it. And you have to have a, an appropriate characteristic dimension for the area. So f typically for uh, an airfoil, if you're looking at lift, then the area would be this length times this length. Oh, I get to use my, don't get to use this very often. Here we go. This area here, <laughs> uh, which you can imagine. Uh, would be the case. So this is the area here. And you can imagine that if you're looking uh, at drag, it would be the area of this plate also, the planiform area. But if you're looking at drag that's applied on a, a sphere, so in other words, whoops, then probably the appropriate planiform area, can't draw the perspective area very well, would be this area. Am I able to draw that? The, 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 the facing area. So the area for a sphere, if, it, if you are thinking about fluid going past it, the appropriate area would be pi d squared upon 4, where this would be this. Happens that the planiform area is the same as the frontal area. This would be the frontal area if you're looking at drag. And so an appropriate area which is defined by the magnitude of the drag coefficient that you're using, CD. So that's kind of it. That's all it is. So I'm not sure what else we have to talk about. Uh, well, we do s talk about some things. This is a, uh, a von Karman vortex street, not sheet. So this is the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, idealized as a sphere. This is the bridge deck. And so wind comes across it at some 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, whatever it is, 
And what happens is it sheds preferentially a vortex from the top and then from the bottom. So if you look at a snapshot in time, this is the one that came off 10 seconds ago, five seconds ago, just came off. And it's like plucking the string on a guitar. This gives a bump to the, the box girder deck when this comes off. This has given a bump to it previously before. And so this excitation, if it's in directly uh, uh, the same frequency as the resonant frequency of the structure, the, the one which it will prefer to vibrate at, then the vibration will just build, amplitude builds, and it becomes the, uh, the, the bridge that shakes itself to pieces. And you can calculate what that frequency is as a function of the airflow velocity, the diameter of your cylinder or your sphere, and the Reynolds number defined with a characteristic dimension of the sphere. Characteristic Reynolds number would have a characteristic dimension, which would be uh, velocity, density of the fluid, and presumably the diameter of the sphere. So some characteristic dimension. And a lot of examples which we won't go through because they're probably more involved than we need to. And so you can look at the, what those drag coefficients would be for a sphere. For a pipe, it was 96 over RE, right, in laminar flow. Happens to be 24 over RE in laminar flow for a sphere. And we'll talk next time about exactly how we use these coefficients to do what we just said we did, and that is that we'd like to calculate what the forces are in structures, so we need to do that in terms of defining a drag coefficient, a velocity of flow, and the other characteristic geometry of the system. And what we'll find out is that to do that, my very last sentence, to do that, we have to figure out exactly where we are on this curve whether we're in the laminar regime, where the drag coefficient for a sphere would be 24 over RE, or whether we're in this regime, whether it would be a different number. And the way that we solve for the drag, the, the force, is different in these because this is a function of viscosity, this is not a function of viscosity, and therefore the solution method differs slightly, but it is very sim simple nonetheless. Great. Questions? No. Fine. Great. That's it. So, so uh, finish this off on Friday. So I'll see you then. No questions? <laughs> Could you get a word in edgeways? <laughs> so anyway, all right. See you uh, Friday.